Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And I'd like to thank you for showing up today for our Curator Conversations during our lunchtime hour. Uh, today for our Curator Conversations, we have our Curator of History, Mr. Kevin Hampton, and we also have our Museum Director, Mr. Chris Kolakowski. Uh, and they're going to be talking about the Spanish Civil War uh, and maybe even, well, not maybe, they're going to be talking about some American involvement uh, in that today, as well as other nationalities with the international brigades. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say thank you to the West Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation for their continued support. Um, they always do a fantastic job in supporting all the free programming uh, that we're allowed to do virtually and a lot of our in-house programming as well. Uh, so thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and their executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson. And we'd also like to th say thank you to um, their sponsor as well, Generac Power Systems. Uh, without these two entities, uh, really, none of these virtual programs get off the ground. So uh, everything that we're doing from our virtual uh, curator conversations, our movie nights, our trivia nights, our drink and draws, and all the other virtual events, uh, that's all because of the support and sponsorship that we get from the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and from Generac Power System. Um, as I stated earlier, we do have our security features turned on today. So if you do have any questions for our presenters, please feel free to submit those uh, via the chat function. Uh, we will get those put into a PowerPoint and we'll present those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so please, all questions to chat. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the platform over to our presenters today. Like I said, our curator of history here at the museum, Mr. Kevin Hampton, and our museum director, Mr. Christopher Kolakowski. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, and welcome. As Eric said, my name is Kevin Hampton, I'm the curator of history, and I'm joined uh, today with the uh, uh, other half of the Chris and Kevin show uh, is Chris Golikowski, our director. And today we're, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, taking, taking one of our interpretive tenants, uh, again, that we've been talking about in our programs over the last several years now. Uh, you know, every veteran is a story. Wisconsin was there and it still matters. And we're going to be looking at, uh, in, in many ways, we're going to be looking at two of those in particular, actually all three, but one, one unique lens on um, Wisconsin was there. Uh, in the sense of Wisconsin was where? And talk a little bit about Wisconsin and, and the overall history of the, of the Spanish Civil War, uh, 85 years, well, 86 years ago uh, today. Uh, actually, there's an anniversary of one of those events that we'll talk about later on today. Uh, so we'll take that moment in history and talk about it as well. Uh, but we wanna talk about what do people know about the Spanish Civil War? Why do we know it? Um, why is it important to remember a lot of times it's really covered in a history book in one paragraph, maybe a page if you're lucky, but pretty much it's the prelude to, it's understood to be the prelude to World War II uh, in the modern history book, uh, you know, textbook. If you do know it, maybe, uh, or maybe you've heard of it with, with certain depictions in, in popular culture or in art history, uh, such as Picasso's uh, very famous uh, painting uh, or you, you may actually, if you're here in Madison, you may have actually encountered it in a way that you didn't even realize you did. Uh, and that would be just running through uh, a park here in Madison. In fact, a few blocks away, just from this very spot where I'm sitting today, is a marker uh, that uh, hopefully you can see on your screen. Chris, tell me you can. We're good to go. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, a marker uh, that is in James Madison Park. Uh, just on the on the lake shore, uh, and you might ask yourself, why is there a marker to the Spanish Civil War, uh, which is hopefully what we're going to dig into today. Uh, so, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you here. Uh, I'll be fully blunt. This is not a conflict that I am terribly knowledgeable about. <laughs> uh, so, I'm looking forward to learning as much as our audience here uh, in our conversation today. And, and really that's the whole point of these conversations. History is a conversation. That's the fun part. It's getting the, getting to learn something you didn't know before. And that's that Indiana Jones moment, if you will, in my opinion. So, uh, this photograph actually, uh, is, is your own personal one, correct? Correct. I took this, uh, last August at the end of last August, when I was out for a walk in downtown Madison it is, it's a beautiful little spot. Um, actually, uh, for those of you who are in Madison, you drive by it on Gorham Street as you're heading in toward town in the corner of James Madison Park right there, right over just about where Hamilton and Gorham come together is where it is. Um, it, just real quick, actually, let's leave it here for a second, Kevin. I'll give a quick okay. overview of what is the Spanish Civil War, because you're right. Most people may sort of be aware of it either through Picasso, through 
the writings of Ernest Hemingway through, you know, there, it pops up here and there. Um, it's fought between 1936 and, and 1939 in Spain. It's a civil war between the nationalists, ultimately under the leadership of Francisco Franco and the Spanish Republicans, who at the time were contemporarily known as the Loyalists. Um, and their president was a, a, a guy named Manuel Azaña. It involved up to about 35,000 international volunteers. We'll get into those in a few minutes. Um, a little bit more detail about them in the, in the famous international brigades um, of whom of those volunteers, roughly one in five didn't leave Spain. They were killed in action, captured and executed, what have you. It was, it was a very uh, brutal conflict um, that also involved international involvement on Franco's side with the Germans and the Italians. And in some ways, was a precursor, has been called a precursor. Some people have even gone as far as to say it's the first battle of the Second World War. I don't go quite that far, but I do think it's a precursor and a foreshadowing of what's coming. Um, and the war ends April 1st, 1939, with the defeat of the Spanish Republic. Five months to the day, mm -hmm. Hitler invades Poland. So that's something that should be borne in mind. When we think about what's happening and how this fits into 20th century history, right. you know, most of the time when you're focused on that period, 1936 to 39, you're looking at Hitler versus the British and the French and the first in the Rhineland, the Anschluss with Austria and then the Czechoslovakia crises. In the background of all that, in fact, almost, you know, kind of like static in the background, if you will, to those crises is the fighting in Spain. And that's something that should be, should be kept in mind. So that's, that's the Spanish Civil War in general. And that monument was put up um, by veterans after the war in honor of all the veterans of the International Brigades. There's only four of those in the United States. There's not that many around the world. Um, that's one of four in the United States. Um, and it lists on there all the Wisconsin, over 40 names of people connected to Wisconsin that served in the International Brigades. And in case you're wondering what that design is there um, with the raised fist, that's a better close up that I took as well. Um, that actually is the medal that the uh, Spanish Republican government issued for the uh, international brigaders for their service. And it translates as International Volunteers for Liberty. And with the raised, raised fist, and then, of course, the, the gun, guns are self-explanatory. Um, right. But that's where the design of that comes from. And you can see the, the years and the names down there as well. And we'll get more into a little bit of those names as we go. Uh, but that's what that monument is. And for those of you who are in Madison or the Madison area, this is literally in your backyard. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting because there's a the placement of it, too, uh, which we can get into later when we talk about one of the veterans that's listed on there. Um, it's near it's only a, a few essentially a stones throw away from a Jewish synagogue. And we'll bring that up later on. Uh, so keep that in mind as we go. Um, so let's let's step back a little bit and and talk a little bit about you've already done the, the nice broad overview. Uh, let's as we are known here on staff, the museum men with maps. We have to have at least one or two maps, right? Uh, so let's first orient people into what we're talking about in terms of size and and, and scope, um, because it's you know in, in generally we know where Spain is on the map, it's in Europe, of course, but sometimes we don't, we have a difficult time understanding its size and, and its ability or, or where it relates to us essentially. So if I share you with this one, can you see this, the map overlay? Yes, yes. Perfect. The, this is a very useful overlay from the CIA World Factbook that illustrates, they do this with many countries. Those of you who may have, were here for when we talked about Ukraine a few months yeah. ago, they did, we did the same thing with Ukraine. And you can see how broad Spain is in the northern part. Um, El Farol, which actually happens to be Franco's hometown, is about where Chicago is on the map. Still a major naval base today for the Spanish. Um, and then Barcelona, which some of you may recall is where the 1992 Olympics were, um, is over what would, if we were, if we were superimposing, would be on the, uh, would be around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You can see Almost Madrid is east of Cincinnati, and you can see Sevilla down in the south, the Barber of Seville. You may have heard of that opera. 
Um, and you can see how big it is when you consider the distance from Chattanooga to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You know, Spain is not a small country. No, not at all. Um, also, just that's almost like Gettysburg. That's that's almost weird. Yeah. Um, now that I think about it. But anyway, uh, so that's something that that is good to remember. Also, this isn't. Don't worry. This isn't the ocean. This is Portugal. Don't forget that there's Portugal there. <laughs> Portugal, <laughs> <just> Spain, <laughs> and then you got Gibraltar there at the very southern tip, right down there, which is yep. the British colony, and yep. then you've got. Um, my phone is reminding me I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> so anyway, um, and then up in the uh, northeastern part, north of Barcelona, is the land border with France in the Pyrenees Mountains. Yeah. yeah. Which is something that needs to be kept in mind. And I think I can get the next one. Uh, this will. This is going to be a bit more detail uh, that we'll talk about later. But just to give you a reference here of what we're talking about uh, in terms of the land border. Portugal, and you've got, of course, Gibraltar, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump, right over to really where actually almost all this begins, uh, right. if you will. Um, so let's let's talk about how does this unfold? How does this play out? So we know when we talk about the 30s in Europe, a lot of people, like you mentioned, were talking about what happens with Germany and what's happening in the in the different regions uh, in Central Europe. So what is uh, happening here? Because these these are this isn't an isolated conflict. This is something really that's been form formulating until you know for the last six to ten years prior to 1936. It's been there's been unrest. There's been um, various small uh, you could call them uh, rebellions. You could call them uh, uh, small conflicts with the, uh, between put down by the army. So in 1936, where are we at? In 1936, we've reached a point um, which is really the culmination of basically the last almost 40 years of political turmoil in Spain. <coughs> Excuse me. Ever since Spain lost the, uh, its empire at the end of the Spanish-American War, um, Spain lost virtually all of its overseas holdings with the exception of Spanish Morocco and just across, you see Tangier there on the map. Um, and a variety of other small holdings here and there, but for all intents and purposes. And so what that did was that started a, a national conversation, political debate over what is Spain? Spain had been a global empire and global power for centuries mm -hmm. prior to 1898. And so what did this mean? It also involved the nature of the monarchy, the nature of the society, especially as, as economics were changing, as society was changing, and some of those trends that you're talking about in the early 20th century um, are, are passing across Europe, things of that nature. And by 1931, a big moment in Spanish history is that uh, the king abdicates and they set up the Spanish Republic. And I'm simplifying, greatly simplifying um, the process because I want to get into the war itself. Um, there are some very good, very good sources on how the war started. Essentially, what it comes down to is that period between 1931 and 1936 is a period of great political division in Spain, where the two sides, you have two visions of what Spain is. You've got the monarchists and the conservatives that tend to view, look backwards towards Spain's um, roots in what, what Spain was after the Reconquista was done in 1492, and looking to the past for inspiration. And then on the other side, you've got the left which coalesces into what's known as the Popular Front. And it's a mix of communists, anarchists, socialists, who are really pushing for a more liberalized Spain, a more liberal vision of what Spain is. And both sides actually trade back and forth elections. But these political divisions, particularly as they harden, as allegations of fraud and disorder begin to come out on both sides, particularly in, this, in the February 1936 election, call into question the legitimacy of the other side. And by basically the spring of 36, both sides view the other as a mortal threat. There's, and that extreme measures may be required to meet that mortal threat and, and preserve Spain. And so that's the motivation with the, the, the popular front having won in, 19, in February of 1936 and with allegations of fraud, some of which there, there's a lot of mixed evidence on this, and UW scholar Stanley Payne has probably done the best sifting of the evidence, and I'll defer to him. 
But for our purposes, the big thing you need to know is there was a considerable perception of the illegitimacy of the current government. And so the Spanish army, which has a tradition of political intervention from time to time, the Spanish army um, decides it's time to rise. And so a junta of generals um, will, including Franco, who's kind of a reluctant participant, he kind of sits on the fence as long as he can and finally will join the, uh, join the, the, the plotters, um, will rise on the 17th and 18th of July, 1939. Try and, you know, try and take over the garrisons, take over the army. And then basically by, by doing that, you take over the major cities, you take over the country and hopefully end this thing in just a few days, maybe a week is the idea. Just kind of overpower everybody um, with the shock shock of the army. Which is it it's interesting to me. It's, it's interesting to me that they think it could go that quickly too, because I mean, this over the course of from 1930 to 1936, essentially, there's been political assassinations, there's been uh, undercutting of each party. Um, the, the coup, the fact that the coup was supposed to take really quickly uh, is, is surprising. But I, I, one thing I, I find very interesting is that, you know, we think, when we think of the Spanish Civil War, for those of us that aren't as, as into it as, as others, you know, you think of one person in, in, in obvious uh, terms, Franco. Um, which, by the way, this is an amazing photo of Franco. If, if you haven't, if you don't think, if you want to picture a 1930s imperialist, uh, this is exactly it. Uh, if you got, I mean, you look at the sash and everything, it's, it's wow. Um, but so you said he was reluctant uh, initially, or, or at least he wasn't the, the reason for it. Correct. Fra Francisco Franco is a very interesting character. Um, he is, he, he's, a, he's an army officer. He actually comes from a naval family. His father had served in the Spanish-American War in the Spanish Navy. Franco was going to go into the Navy and follow his dad, but the destruction of the Spanish Navy during at the hands of the United States, the Spanish basically stopped recruiting for their uh, Naval Academy for several years because they didn't have they didn't need the officers because they didn't have the ships. <laughs> so he goes into the army. He ends up fighting in Morocco, has a miraculous survival. And uh, as, as you know, and, and gets a lot of fame, and by the age of 33, becomes a, a general officer. He's the youngest general in Europe since Napoleon, the youngest general in Europe at the time that he's promoted. And he's 44, by the way, when, when the Spanish Civil War breaks out in 1936. That gives you an idea of his rapid rise. He parlays that, he's, he's a favorite of the monarch, um, hero of some of the anti you know, insurrections in Morocco and things of that nature. And by 1930, he's in command of the military academy in Spain. And then shortly after that becomes the army chief of staff until he's removed after the election of February 1936 and sent to the Canary Islands kind of in exile. So he's got a very prominent place. And he's one of those guys, he's a monarchist at heart. He's, he's definitely personally in sympathy with the objectives of kind of the conservative wing of the the plotters, if you will, the, the right right side of, of the right, as opposed to the right and left side of Spanish politics. Yeah. And, um, but he also is very protective of his position. And he will blow the way the winds are blowing. When he's chief of staff, he will help the Republic keep order and put down some strikes um, with some considerable brutality, I might add. Yeah. He's, a, he's a man that is ruthless when he has to be. And is not afraid to do that if he has to take the gloves off. Um, so that's his reputation uh, by the summer of 1936. Okay, and so it's, it begins really as this this internal conflict between the, essentially the destiny of Spain and who is going to control it and what political direction they're going to move in. So I just want to bring this one up here because this is a very fascinating. Uh, propaganda poster put out by the Republicans, um, because I do want to talk about, we want to transition here into how does an internal conflict in Spain elevate to an international uh, conflict? Uh, international playgrounds, is, it seems very uh, uh, kind of harsh to say because it, it doesn't uh, fit, but really you've got all these different foreign powers uh, now all of a sudden playing a part in this conflict, right? Right. First of all, let's go back to the map, yeah. the overview map of the conflict, because I want to show what happens. The, the uh, dark tan 
is what the what the plotters get um, within the first say week of the week of the it's about a third of Spain first week or so of the war. But most of the force you see is concentrated to the north, and then the mm-hmm. biggest and probably best trained force that falls under the the rebels. We'll, I'll call them the nationalists because that's the name that they chose for themselves, nationalistas. Mm-hmm. Um, is Franco with the Army of Africa in Morocco? Yeah. But you'll notice what's between Morocco and this. This is how it becomes international right off the bat, because you'll notice what's between Morocco and. The mainland, yeah, nine miles of the Straits of Trafalgar, and um, I think I misspoke. Actually, it's the Straits of uh, yeah, it is the Straits of Straits of Gibraltar. Gibraltar, yeah, Straits of yeah. Gibraltar. Thank you, um, I misspoke. Yeah. So Franco, through contacts that he has through at Tangier, is the uh, is able to work and ask for help from Mussolini, who is considered the premier fascist in the. Uh, in Europe at the time, yeah, and also uh, for Hitler, asks from Nazi Germany. And both Hitler and Mussolini are able to provide transport aircraft, which is important because the most of the Spanish Navy, uh, the officers had tried to rebel, the crews had mostly killed their officers and taken command of the ships and are patrolling the Straits of Gibraltar. So they need to fly, they need to be able to fly the Army of Africa over to the mainland. And it is on German and uh, Italian transport aircraft, the first strategic airlift in military history. And here's a photograph of some of the Moroccan troops. Uh, most of the Muslim, Muslim Africans that are involved have a fearsome, fearsome reputation. Yeah. Um, and the Spanish Foreign Legion will also be involved. The Spanish Foreign Legion, all you need to know about the Spanish Foreign Legion, its mentality is its motto, Viva la Muerte, which is long live death. Yeah. But that'll, this that'll is the it. airlift in action. <laughs> And those are the troops that will get across. And because Franco is able to early negotiate, um, he's one of the last to join the plot, but because he's the one that has the most reliable and dependable connections to the outside, he 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 occupies a very influential place very quickly among the leaders, among the nationalist leaders. So this is a huge moment. Because all of a sudden, this has no longer, this has broadened beyond Spain. Yeah. Now you got the Germans and Italians in, and then the Soviets will begin to supply arms to the Republicans. Yep. And also through the Communist International, begin to put out a call for volunteers to resist, uh, resist Francos and the nationalists in Spain, which is how you get the formation of the international brigades. Yeah, and that actually directly leads to, to the Wisconsin involvement because you have a very significant uh, socialist population in Milwaukee. Uh, and we have our own communist uh, groups uh, here in the state at the time. And that brings in some of those, a lot of those volunteers. One, one thing I did want to point out is that most of uh, Franco's troops, didn't they fly into uh, Seville? Yeah, most of them flew into Seville. Some flew into Cadiz, but yeah, most of them flew into Seville and then began to march north on Madrid. At the same time, General Mola and his army in the north around Valladolid and Salamanca began to move south um, toward Madrid. The idea being take the capital and you'll snuff out the Spanish Republic. Um, And they will meet outside Madrid and attack into the city and actually capture part of the university complex in November 1936, before exhaustion, uh, plus the arrival of the first two international brigades, which are European volunteers, um, will help them hold. And this also, by the way, you may have heard recent use of the term fifth column. If you're familiar with World War II, you hear that a lot. Here's yeah. a tr- piece of trivia that may, you know, may win you a trivia contest one day. Is the, the term actually comes from here, because General Mola is the one who says, I'm going to advance on Madrid with four columns. And when we get close to the city, I've got a fifth column ready to strike when the time is right. In other words, among the city population. Yeah. So that's where that term comes from. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Huh. So, but you'll notice the battle lines stabilize. Basically, the dark tan and then the little lighter tan is where, where the uh, nationalists get at the end of 1936, is the battle lines at the end of 1936. And you can see the effects of... Franco's arrival, because, uh, you know, the coup is in July, and then, of course, 
the, the airlift the, assisted by the Germans uh, isn't until September, I think, um, or August, I think. It's actually August. Yeah, First and so then they move. August. You can see that, you know, bringing in that army uh, from the south, this is what falls in that wake. Um, now, I do want to point out one thing about this, because I, I saw a question in the chat already about the skull and crossbones. Oh, sure. At some of these places. One of the things that's going to happen all through the war is Franco, and he's, he's going to be named Caudillo. He's going to be named basically um, leader of the nationalist movement on October 1st, 1936. Um, he is going to fight a war that involves not just moving the armies across. He is going to, at the same time, a, a political repression of his enemies, sometimes extremely bloody. And there are accounts I will not get into here because they are they are very uh, distressing to read, particularly at Batayos, where they uh, put 2,400 uh, into a bullfighting ring at Batayos and then uh, proceed to turn machine guns on them with, uh, I will let your imagination do the rest. Yeah. But there is, there's a, they are moving along and they are installing a regime behind them in, as the battle lines move. And that's something that needs to be borne in mind, is that Franco is, is looking to win an absolute victory on the battlefield. He's also looking to win an absolute victory at the same time politically. Yeah. There was a, an interesting article that was in the State Journal, Wisconsin State Journal, in the summer and early fall of 36. Uh, and it actually is a comparison of the uh, Moorish uh, invasion, if that's the right word, um, of long ago Spanish history uh, comparative to the one that was currently happening at that time uh, because the, the imagery that they're seeing come out of this uh, this era, of course, or this, what events are happening, you know, you're seeing those troops that you hadn't, uh, that you saw before or you hadn't seen before. And even, I'll, I'll bring up a couple more images here of this is his advance, this is, uh, uh, Franco's advance north. Um, the one that I'm looking for is this one. And this is his honor guard, uh, which is the more, uh, I think they call it the Moorish guard, yep. actually. Yep. Um, that is going with him on this, this military campaign uh, north through the country. And that's, that, that creates an exotic flair and intimidation. The intimidation factor cannot be underestimated. Right. right. But you'll and, also see how Franco, with his appearance, the way he's already, he's building a cult of personality around yeah. him. And he's centralizing nationalist feeling around him. And that's right. something that should be borne in mind, too. And note the the Roman salute, yep. um, which is, we, we think, you know, we think of it as a German thing, a Nazi thing, but it was adopted by Mussolini and Franco long before. That's right. And that's hearkening back to the to ancient glories. Yep. And nostalgia is, is yep. a heck of a thing. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, all right. So we're now on the outskirts of Madrid. Do you want me to bring that map up? Yeah, let's bring up that map um, because for the first few months of 1937, in other words, 85 months right now, or 85 years ago right now, um, there's going to be the, the fighting that involves the international brigades in particular, particularly the, the, the folks from Wisconsin, is going to be in and around Madrid because both sides realize that possession of the capital is a great prize. And this is where the red line is where the battle lines basically will stabilize by about 85 years ago right now, as a matter of fact. Franco, after trying to attack the city frontally, will be stopped in the University City. There's still battle damage in the University of Madrid campus from the fighting um, that involved uh, volunteers from the 11th and 12th International Brigades. There ultimately will be five major international brigades and they're numbered 11 through 15, um, using Roman numerals, by the way. The 15th yeah, that, Brigade yeah. will involve, um, and they try and group them at least by battalion and they'll number usually four battalions. They'll try and group the battalions by language, sometimes for complete brigades by language as well. There's an Italian battalion named for Garibaldi. There's several German battalions. There's quite a few Polish battalions. Yeah. Uh, French, there's a British one, the British battalion. Um, can Canada sends one, the Mackenzie Papineau, although that, the Mac Paps is there known. There's a lot of Americans that are in the Mac Paps because they speak English. 
And then you get the Lincoln Battalion and then the short-lived George Washington Battalion, which ultimately gets put together. Um, and basically the Spanish Republican Army um, is not very well equipped and not very well trained. There's a lot of disorder because a lot of your officers went with Franco. So some of the best troops, and I'm going to explain, best trained and best equipped troops on the, on the Republican side are in many ways the international brigades and they will be used again and again as shock troops. And one of the first places that they are is at the Har Valley of Harama. And actually, if you could flip back to the map real quick. Having tried to take the city frontally, Franco was gonna try and envelop the city from the south and cut it off from the rest of Spain and the Mediterranean coast, which is off the map there to the east, north being at the top. And it launched an offensive across the R Harama River, which you see the Harama Valley right there. Go, if you could go back to the word Harama and then come down, you see those two rivers. Um, it'll result in that bridgehead there um, through the mountains and through what becomes known as, the, known as the Harama River Valley and will inspire a song from the International Brigades because they will attack head on and for about three months without rest will uh, fight the nationalists and stop them, um, stop them in their tracks. Uh, oh. It's an incredible fight. Um, it, it, it leaves its mark on everybody. And the international brigades, when they go in, Clarence Kalin, um, who's here from Madison, um, and we can, talk, we can talk a little bit more about his service soon, because he actually lived, he's buried over in Forest Hill or, um, here in Madison, yeah. um, talked about how their training, they got over, they had a few days of drill in terms of how to march and fight and stuff like that. They fired five shots from their rifles which most of them were Russian that had the Imperial Eagle scratched out. So in other words, they'd been around since the World War I. Mm -hmm. And then go into action against nationalist troops, many of them being highly trained Moroccans. And a lot of these battalions will lose a third of their men in the process. And it's a severe bloodletting, but they'll stop Franco's offensive there. And that's something that should, uh, should be borne in mind. Um, a lot like of that. these veterans... Sorry, Kevin. Real quick, a lot of these, a lot of these veterans in the Lincoln Battalion are in their twenties and thirties, so they're too young for World War One. Mm -hmm. Some of their, some of their officers, however, are not, um, and you'll find several of them throughout the Lincoln Battalion will actually have a, a succession of commanders because of casualties. Well over a dozen commanders in the year and a half or so, two years that it exists. Um, most of those are World War One veterans. But many of the younger volunteers, like Clarence Kalin, are either they're, they're young socialists, they're, some of them are communists, some of them are true believers. Some of them, quite frankly, are, you'd be amazed how many merchant seamen there are in the international brigades, particularly in the American battalion, because of the Great Depression. Right. And there's just not shipping, there's just not the economic opportunity, so this is something to do. And then you get some people that are very motivated. They're, they're there because... They're anti-Franco, and they're anti-Franco is being painted as a fascist. I think he's more authoritarian. That's a debate that can be had and is still had. Um, and there's a lot of people that say, well, here's, here's the fight against fascism. Here's round one. I want to be there for round one. Yeah. So you get all these different motivations for why these people are here. Well, and, and Kalen says it as one of the best quotes that I've ever read about it, and it probably will, will ring true to, to what we hear today. Um, but Kalen says uh, of his time in Spain, he says, there wasn't any choice. If you were against totalitarianism, if you were against injustice, you had to care about what happened in Spain. So Spain was where I knew I needed to be. And that is a great summary for that, I think. Yeah, that's, that's fairly common based on what I've been able to see. And a lot of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archives are online or they're available at NYU. And there are some at the University of Illinois. Um, from what I've seen, that's a fairly common, common impression, um, is that that's what motivates them to come. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the brigade itself? Like we've, you've kind of been mentioning, I should have brought this up before. Well, one of the things about the Lincoln Brigade is the Lincoln Brigade is the first really truly integrated unit in American military history. It's not a U.S. unit, but right. it is Americans fighting together in an integrated unit. As a matter of fact, um, the gentleman on the left there is Oliver Law, 
who will command the Lincoln Battalion at the Battle of Brunete um, in July of 1937 outside of Madrid. Um, he'll get killed in command of the battalion. That's the first time that an, a, a, a black officer had commanded white Americans in battle in the history of the United States. And that's something that uh, is, is worth noting. And he yeah. talked about how there's a quote I found um, he wrote before his death. And he said he was, he was overjoyed to be there because it was about my co the content of my character. That's what he was happy about, that he was, that there was not anything else. And Clarence Kalin, in his oral history, which we have in the museum archives, talks about how there was no, there was no question of race. It was, we're all in this together. We're all doing this. And let's, uh, you know, let's, let's get on with the job that we have. Um, and one of the things I love about this photograph is it shows you a lot about the, the Lincoln Battalion. And they use the, at the Lincoln Battalion, the 15th Brigade never had a formal name, but everybody started calling it the Lincoln Brigade. Yeah. So you'll see those names basically used interchangeably. But one of the things I love about the Lincolns is, is you can really get a sense of them in this photograph here. That's Law there to the left, his political commissar. And yes, because the Communist Party had set this up, they had a political commissar that was responsible for, you know, kind of like, I hesitate to take it as far as the regimental chaplain in other units, but oh. certainly was responsible for making sure that, that these volunteers understood some ideological underpinnings of why they're here. That's Steve Nelson with his, look, look at their body language, know, arms right? over the shoulder. I mean, that tells you a lot right there about the camaraderie. Yep. You see the look on everybody's faces. There's a certain freedom. There's a certain joy. And then you got the guy tip, <laughs> tipping the wine cask <laughs> over his face. I mean, you know, what a, what a great picture. But if yeah. you want to see the spirit of the Lincolns when they volunteer, um, you know, this is, they're, they're doing something for what they consider to be an important cause. And they mm -hmm. are doing something that for them is a great adventure and a great crusade. And you see that spirit. The other thing that you see in here is you'll notice their equipment. There's not a standard uniform in that photo. Right. Also, the helmets are old French World War I helmets. And Clarence Kalin talks about that. And I've seen that with some others. They cleaned out the World War I surplus stores in New York as they were, because most of these guys will, will, will the, 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 the Communist Party or the socialist organizations that recruit them will pay their way to New York and pay their way across the Atlantic. And on the way, when they sail from New York, they all have duffel bags full of World War I surplus stuff. Yeah. And that's their equipment. And, but you'll see it creates kind of a motley appearance for the troops. Um, but nonetheless, you know, they're here. They're good fighters. They stop Franco um, at Harama. They fight hard at Brunete. They fight hard in, in every battle that they're in. I find it interesting uh, when you're talking about the, the equipment. So this is a photograph. Here's, here's Kaylin here, uh, down here in the bottom right. Um, and a few other Wisconsin volunteers uh, that were identified. You've got Fred Palmer, Harry Lichter, uh, Ray Dersch and John Cookson, and then here's Clarence Kalin. But it, it, look at the, just the, what they're wearing. I mean, that's almost Polish uh, from World War II, those berets. And some of that is um, the style at the time. Some right. of that is European influenced. Um, because all, all, all these guys will land in France. They're not officially allowed on their passports. They've actually stamped not valid for travel in Spain. So yeah. they don't tell anybody they're going to Spain. And so you get a lot of these people, when they get to France, they start to kind of dress and try and, and create yeah. affectation. I suspect, educated guest tells me this photograph is taken in France before they go to Spain, especially yeah. because Cookson, who's Kalen's best friend and is a UW dropout, he'd been at the University of Wisconsin before he left his studies to go to Spain, um, is Kalen's best friend and is, ultimately will die in Spain. He's one of those that will die in Spain. Yeah. All right, so then where to next, Chris? Uh, let's look back, let's go back to the map and let's look at the course of the war here um, and just kind of talk through some things that happened. Um, after stopping Franco first south of Madrid at the Harama River, Harama Valley, and then north of Madrid at the Battle of Guadalajara, which is 75 years ago right now, where the Italian army which had been successful and had been feared, was stopped by two international brigades at Guadalajara. 
and there's some of the Italian tanks right there, um, will, you know, fighting will shift and the Republic decides to go on the offensive and launch a series of offensives, as does Franco, by the way. Um, Franco starts off in the north, and uh, we'll just talk real quick about the fighting up in the north around Bilbao and the push up into the Basque region, where even today the name Franco up there is a very, very dirty word. Yeah. Um, and as part of that campaign on the 26th of April, 1937, is the bombing of the town of Guernica which is where the Picasso painting comes from. It's the first bombardment of a, of a city. It was a city of, I forget how many, it was, it was a city of about 5,000 people, I believe. Right, yeah. And death, death toll, death estimates vary, um, particularly with the destruction, but the destruction of the city speaks for itself. And wave upon wave of German uh, aircraft, um, commanded actually incidentally by uh, the Red Baron's nephew, or cousin, yeah. the Red Baron's cousin, um, reduced the city to rubble. And when Pablo Picasso, and there's some of the, the uh, JU-52s with the X marking for the nationalist side on the airplanes, uh, the German Condor Legion is what they had been known. They'd been it, part of the German military aid. Plus, Hitler is using the opportunity to try out new planes like the JU-52, right. the Messerschmitt 109, the Stuka JU-87, which, of course, will... Uh, yeah, and there's a Stuka right there in, in uh, nationalist markings. Yep. Um, also tanks. The first use of Blitzkrieg and tank tactics will be in the 1938 offensive um, from Zer uh, across toward the Mediterranean. So it's a proving ground. Hitler's using this as much a proving ground for his army as right. he is supporting Franco's objectives. And one of the objectives with that is not only supporting Franco's offensive, but it's also to tr test out this new idea of strategic bombing and what it can do. And Guernica is that laboratory. And um, I'm making, I'm being very, very simplified with this because there's you know, obviously a lot to cover. But yeah. that's where Picasso, when he reads about what's happened at Guernica, paints that famous painting that he is, he's known for and, and now hangs outside what, the UN? Yeah, the Security Council chamber, um, which was very interesting because it came back from conservation on February 1st, uh, 2022 and is gonna go out on an international um, tour. They're actually gonna send it around, uh, but it's, it's intriguing because this is the tapestry. They've made a tapestry out of the painting and this is what hangs outside of that room. Um, but it, it's a, a very interesting parallel um, because Picasso's painting actually goes on a tour as well and is at the World Fair, uh, the World's Fair in 1938. 1938, yeah. The Spanish Republic hangs on to the Spain pavilion and they display that painting in the pavilion. And you can just see the size. It was huge. It was in New York and now it's actually back in Madrid. It hangs in the National Museum in Madrid. In Madrid. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's an incredibly powerful art piece of artwork and it captures the, the terror and the violence mm -hmm. of what happened there um, and, and resonates today. Yeah. resonates resonates today so after the northern offensive uh the battle of brunete will be fought it it's one thing to, to defend it's another thing to attack and the uh nationalists which are getting better equipped and getting larger armies matter of fact they'll have a million men under arms by the end of the war um prove to be better plus one of the other problems is the spanish republican army is highly centralized yeah. So you don't have the initiative at the lower levels that is encouraged in other armies, notably the U.S. Army, particularly in World War II. And so the offensives will often bog down because they'll break through in three places in the front, but the fourth place will hang on. And so everybody's got to stop and wait for that fourth place to get reduced, and that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Also, these troops are advancing without cover. They don't have a lot of air cover. Um, and nationalists, you can imagine, nationalist snipers will go after them. Um, and that's ultimately what gets all of her laws. He's leading a charge, just like out of the Civil War. He grabs, you know, grabs the flag and says, let's go. And is leading forward you know, with a rifle, follow me, and is machine gunned. Um, and that happens. That's why the Lincoln Battalion loses so many commanders, is because you have to lead from the front. And then in 1937, um, you can see they secure. And then in 38, um, they'll launch an offensive 
and pushed basically across to the Mediterranean. Um, the blue line here is the River Ebro. And as they're pushing through the, the uh, German, with the Germans in the lead, it's really the first victims of Blitzkrieg or the international brigades. Many of them are caught up in a retreat. And if you look and you mark the town Gandisa, that's a battleground twice in 1938. The first time is when they're retreating from the west from where you see Teruel off the map. They're retreating back across. And this is a broken open plain, kind of like what you'd see I don't know, in, in southern Minnesota, just across the Mississippi as you're going west on I-90 toward the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. As they're retreating across, a whole bunch of the Lincolns end up getting surrounded and end up getting caught up by, overtaken by Franco troops in and around Gandesa. And many of them, including the famous Robert Hale Merriman, who's probably the best known of the command, senior commanders of the Lincolns, um, get, get either captured and executed, killed, go missing, and that's one of the places where Cookson goes missing. Um, Kalen, in his oral history, has a great account of escaping Franco troops. Um, and despite being wounded, being able to swim across the river, which basically becomes a dividing line um, from April until July. And that's that dark blue line that you see right there. And then they counterattack. And then the Nationalists decide to launch an offensive across the river, try and regain some of the ground. Um, and it will turn into what's actually the longest and harshest battle of the entire war, um, which will basically last from July until October of 1938. One of the big things that the Republic's trying to do at this point is to regain some ground, constant, you know, try and force Franco to, to, you know, off his game so he doesn't control all the offensives. Right. But also they're trying to hang on because they're expecting war to break out in Europe over Czechoslovakia. Yep. And when it doesn't, as Paul Preston writes, that's when the death, death knell of the Republic was written, was in Munich in September of 38. Yeah. And it's this, the defeat of this, defeat of this offensive at that point um, to save face and as kind of a way to hopefully try and negotiate something with Franco, they decide to evacuate the internet, what's left of the international brigades. There's only 12,000 of them that are left and they are evacuated in October of 1938 and they are told as they're marching through Barcelona with flowers of thank you being thrown at them, they are told, um, you are history, you are legend. And that's on the monument in James Madison Park today. Yeah. I, I find it interesting because Barcelona was also supposed to be the site of, what was it, the uh, uh, Olympic, not the Olympics, because the Olympics, of course, were in Berlin, but the counter Olympics, if you will. Uh, they back in the People's Olympiad, which yeah. was actually scheduled for July 20th, 1936. And it right was when... being held uh, in protest of, of Nazi Germany hosting the 1936 Olympics. Yeah. You had and mentioned... they were going to have it in Barcelona. Yeah, you had mentioned um, before, and I'm with one eye on the clock, um, you know, you're mixing up, some people consider Franco a fascist, some people consider him a totalitarian. Um, either way, a dictator regardless. Um, one of the things that comes out in that time, and, and perhaps this is what leads it to it, is that Condor Legion um, that you mentioned before. Uh, the connection between Hitler and Franco is, is amplified further um, simply by the relationship between the two. Um, but it doesn't come to full fruition, I think, like Hitler wanted in World War II, because Franco doesn't actually join officially uh, uh, the Axis powers, but he's assisted by Mussolini, and at, at the height of Mussolini's power, too. You know, Mussolini gets dwarfed at the end of the 30s and into the 40s by, by Hitler, but he is the, the real, as you mentioned or alluded to, he's the driving force in the early 30s. In the mid Correct. The Rome Berlin Axis is founded in 1936 over joint alliance to Franco or joint mm -hmm. assistance to Franco. So that's something that, that should be borne in mind. The other thing about Franco is when the war ends in, in April 1st, basically the, the Republic is after Barcelona falls January 26, 1939, to a nationalist offensive. There's about 30 percent of Spain that is left in Republican hands. Franco launches a concentric offensive, which is that light pink area you see right there. Concentric offensive, um, the last week of March, 1939, 
takes Madrid within days. Albacete falls very quickly. And by April 1st, uh, Alicante on the coast, the last port in Cartagena, are in nationalist hands. And so very quickly, very quickly in 39, the Republic just collapses like a house of cards. The country is absolutely devastated. The economy is devastated by what has happened, the dislocation. There are towns that are in complete ruins. Um, Belquite, as a matter of fact, which is just south of Zaragoza there on the map, um, is left in ruins as a monument to the the hard fighting that was there that the nationalists had been engaged in. Spain is, is, is exhausted and Franco needs to solidify his hold. And then of course, five months later, Poland's invaded and World War II breaks out. Right. Franco is very interested in working with the Axis. And if you read Paul Preston's biography of Franco, there's a great exploration of this. But Franco's also asking for certain things as well to bolster Spain, economic, but also territorial. Particularly when France falls in 1940, he says, I'd like French Morocco, please. I'll join the cause. Give me French Morocco. Well, that creates problems because they want to keep what's the unoccupied France. They want to keep unoccupied France happy. And so, right. you know, basically his price tag's too high. Yeah. And it disappoints, it frankly disappoints Hitler. Now, some Spanish do get involved. The Blue Division, that's maybe, you know, that's that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation. Whole yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, that's about as far as Franco is willing to go. And then as soon as the Allies invade North Africa, you know, the, his tune starts to change a little bit. Yep. So he's, he's playing a bit of a double game throughout World War II. But part of it is he's gotten, he, aside from geography, he doesn't have a lot of military resources to bring to the fight. Right. And, and you, you said it there. I mean, it's decimated. Look at all these cities that are, um, bombarded and, and almost not, not all of them are leveled but quite a few are um, and and just the sheer devastation across the, the entire country um, it's it's very hard to battlefields like the Ebro battlefields like Brunete for decades after the war you know you talk about the iron harvest after World War One with all the unexploded ammunition and just stuff lying around the battlefield yeah. they stay for decades after the war still bringing up and bringing up bodies, as a matter yeah. of fact. Yeah. So that's something that should be borne in mind. It should also be borne in mind that, that April 1st is not completely the end of Republican resistance. Uh, there's a guerrilla war that goes on in the northern part of France, and particularly the Basque region, or uh, the northern part of Spain, excuse me, until 1951. Wow. When, it's finally, when it's finally put down, yeah. Um, for you, uh, for out there watching uh, those football fans, uh, that is the uh, Barcelona Stadium uh, that play where the soccer is uh, today. I believe uh, they've played a few games there, uh, and it's that's the original Olympic Stadium that was built for that 1936 uh, Olympics. I do want to have time for some question and answer. We've got about seven minutes or so until we're up. And, and as everyone knows who's been on these calls before, uh, you probably realize that Chris and I will linger on uh, and chat and talk as long as, uh, as we need to or as long as uh, it, it's so as questions are asked. So with that, I, I think, Chris, unless you have any other final comments. I think we're good. I, I, I would encourage people to look at When you think about European history, read more about the Spanish Civil War. And if you think you know Europe in the 30s and 40s, when you look at it from the through the lens of the Spanish Civil War, you will look at it through a whole new light. And that's something that should uh, I I would encourage everybody to explore and think about um, as you think about this period. And what I would end with, uh, just as a final comment, uh, is the idea that history, you know, we, we could look at something like this and it feels so detached because it's so far away. Um, but as we've talked about since the very beginning of this conversation, in many ways, history, this kind of history is in our own backyard and we don't even realize it as evident of this monument that people might walk past and not know what it's there for. And that's a perfect way to bring it back home. So, Eric, 
Yeah, no, fantastic. I was just going to say, what, what a way to, to wrap it all up, Kevin. Come full circle. Excellent. Excellent work, guys. Uh, we do have quite a few questions for you. Um, we'll jump right into those. Let me just uh, get my slideshow going here. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, about 1898, uh, and one of our viewers was curious if, if the Spanish-American War and, and the consequences of that aided any of the growth of the roots of the Civil War. The short answer is yes. Um, we can expand on this when we do 1898, because we are going to do a Spanish-American War talk at some point, Kevin. Oh, yeah. I know you, you <laughs> and I have said we'll do that. Um what I would suggest is when we, we talked about the divisions in Spain that produced the Civil War, some of those divisions start in the decade after the war, the, the war with the United States, because it creates a national conversation over what is Spain now, now that now that Spain has ended centuries of, of significant overseas empire, what is Spain now, what will Spain be, and what is Spain going to be on the world stage. And so some of these, some of the fuses that explode in 1936 are lit in 1898. I would agree with that. And one thing that we've talked about is that these aren't questions uh, that are isolated to this conflict. This is, these are questions that face a lot of different countries and situations throughout history. So keep that in mind. You know, we've, we've talked about how History isn't necessarily what happens, it's why it happens. Um, and maybe you've seen some parallels and, and hopefully you have through history because that's what learning from history is all about. The next question, um, how did the United Kingdom react to the outbreak of the Civil War? The British were in an isolationist mood. The British also were in turmoil because this is during the reign of Edward VIII in 1936. And the government is, has got a lot on its plate. And actually they form what's called the Non-Intervention Committee, um, which is ostensibly to create international cover to, to kind of keep, try and keep the conflict localized. Um, the French will go back and forth about supporting the, the, the uh, uh, Spanish. Their borders will open and close throughout the war. Um, the Russians are probably the ones that most uh, consistently support the Republicans. Yeah. Um, but the Non-Intervention Committee is there basically, and the, they would be the formation, if you've heard of the neutrality patrol that they have with British warships and things like that. Um, it only does so much um, because the limits on the, the non-intervention include only military munitions, but things like trucks and oil. In other words, Texaco makes a mint selling oil. So does Ford and Chevy selling trucks to the nationalist side. Uh, so things like that are not part of the non-intervention committee purview. Um, and it's, they kind of, they play an isolationist side for much of it. And a lot of the issues of why they're appeasing in Europe, in Central Europe, are keep them out of active involvement in the, uh, in, in the Spanish Civil War. I was gonna say, that's the same thing where, you know, you have to remember that only, what, 12 years before, uh, they're still reeling from an entire generation that was lost on the battlefields of France. Um, so the re same reasons why those appeasement uh, policies were justified for other areas in Eastern Europe, it's the same concept of isolation. Same thing for us, frankly, for that matter. We were uh, isolating as well, or not isolating, but we were figuring it was their problem, not ours um, in many cases. So looking at uh, some of the actual veterans, especially the Wisconsin veterans, including uh, Kalen's oral history, it's very interesting to see their take on why this failed, uh, why their efforts, they, they fought, but why it failed because they don't have a whole lot of nice feelings about the fact that they were supposed, the countries did stay isolationist. They thought they were fighting the first battle of what Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, but the first real battle against what would eventually become World War II. Uh, gentlemen, what role did religion play in this conflict? Quite a lot. I'll simply say this: as Franco had the unstinting support of the Catholic Church. 
And so the nationalist side very much, um, very much invoked that. The Republican side did itself no favors because some of its factions went after nuns and churches and things like that. And the nationalists gave the nationalists a huge propaganda victory. And probably the best recruiting poster for Franco was this picture right here, which is a, the execution of Christ by some anarchist militia allied to the Republicans in August of 1936. This is a statue not that far south of Madrid. And when this was published, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people, um, a, lot of, a lot of Protestants as well, who uh, this branded, this stuck to the Republican side like glue all through the war and turned a lot of people off to the Republican side because it, that this, it's not true, but the perception was that the Republicans were nothing but godless communists. And that was not the truth. But they couldn't get away from that perception. They lost the, they lost the battle of uh, commun strategic communication, as we put it in modern terms. The PR battle. You got it. <laughs> um, did any women volunteer to join the Lincoln Brigade or any of the international brigades? Or was there a large... Uh, female presence from any of the international community? There were mostly in the hospitals. There were some early that joined some of the early militias. Um, some of the ath female athletes from the People's Olympiad actually joined as well in the early going. Most, the frontline brigaders were almost all men, but there were quite a few women, particularly in the support areas, hospitals. There are, there are accounts of, of nurses marrying patients and things like that. Um, and there were quite a few, the, the, that was one of the things that actually distinguished the Republicans from the Nationalists, is the Nationalists um, were building a very traditional society in terms of women's roles in that society, whereas the Republicans were envisioned a much more empowered role for women. And you saw that again and again in their, uh, in their policies and also in, in how, they structured, um, how they structured their forces. Mm -hmm. I think we just have a, a couple more. And then there's a couple that came in late that I did not get onto the PowerPoint, gentlemen. So I have to ask those uh, orally. <clears throat> what restrictions, if any, do governments place on the recruitment for international brigades? Well, the big thing is, is that you didn't really have anybody. It's not like the Flying Tigers where you could get leave from the U.S. military to go serve. Um, there was... There wasn't a restriction beyond the passport stamp. There was no formal restriction. Um, but these people are not military. There are a few ROTC cadets, including a couple from Wisconsin. Merriman was an ROTC graduate who had done his commitment. Um, so you do have a few of those. You have some U.S. military veterans, but there's no active serving U.S. military personnel that go over. There are a few that go over as observers to see what they can learn, but they do it in U.S. uniform. Um, so that's probably the biggest restriction there. Uh, when these guys come home, and gals, the FBI brands them, the term is premature anti-fascist. Yep. And so many of them, and Kalen talks about some of this, about losing economic opportunity. There's certain things he'll teach government or he'll teach communications at Truax Field as a civilian contractor. Um, but it, when it's figured out his background, they'll kind of push him aside. There are others, um, a good example is Herman Betcher in the 32nd Division at Buna, who uh, was an officer in the International Brigades, does not get a commission in the U.S. Army, serves as a sergeant, earns, earns a distinguished service cross. Um, the service in the Lincolns are, is viewed with suspicion by uh, Hoover's FBI. And then in the 50s, during McCarthyism, a lot of these guys are targets yep. because of their communist affiliation in the 30s. There's a, a very interesting article after Kalen's passing, I think it was in 2009, um, where his daughters here in Madison and, and, and other places um, requested a Freedom of Information Act from the FBI file on their father and read through, you know, who was watching them when. It's very interesting. Premature anti-fascist. That's a great term. Um, next question, and, and I think this kind of this kind of piggybacks off the last one. Uh, and, and you did, Chris, mention you know some of the American government 
uh, restrictions that came in place afterwards. Um, but I'll go to the second part of this question. Did the, did, did these um, freedom fighters or these, any of these uh, American uh, fighters for the international brigades receive any support from the American government? Because of the Neutrality Act, the US government, and Franklin Roosevelt actually later said his policy toward the Spanish Civil War was a big mistake. But they held the American government, which was still in the throes of the depression, keep in mind, 36 to 39, we are not out of the depression by any stretch of the imagination. Does not wanna get involved in an overseas conflict. You've got war that breaks out in China in 1937. And if you've studied that war, you know the, the American feeling, even after Americans get killed over there in the US Navy, don't, we're not getting involved. So there's a tremendous isolationist sentiment, the depression's going. The United States government was not supporting these people. Um, now, they weren't op opposing them either, but the United States government was not helping them. And these people, when they came home, and Kalen talks about it actually, when he comes back, he doesn't get veteran status. He, the, when he comes back as a wounded, ve wounded veteran of the Lincoln Brigades, um, he's actually crippled. His arm's crippled for the rest of his life. He has nerve damage. He's taken care of by private societies, um, socialist-affiliated societies that pay his medical bills. Um, and it's, it's organizations like that, that that actually support these, these people. The U.S. government was not... The, the, the U.S. government stance in the 30s was neutral. And then, of course, later when the FBI gets involved, we've already talked about that. Yeah, and the United States announced at the, at the very beginning in August of 36 um, that they would follow the policy of the non-intervention committee of the League of Nations. Um, and uh, I think Mexico was the first one to actually send support and openly support the Republicans. But then shortly thereafter, in, all, in middle of August, uh, the UK actually bans, I think, the exports of all war material to Spain. Um, so you can see how strong of a isolationist policy it is uh, for those countries. It's no coincidence because of that history. It's no coincidence most of the Spanish Republicans end up in exile in Mexico, in Mexico right. City. Right. Uh, I think we just have maybe one or two more questions, guys. Uh, did the Republicans ever wage a guerrilla war against Franco? Uh, I can't see the rest of the question. At any time after 1939. I saw this question come up during the discussion earlier, and that's why I touched on it, and made sure to mention that guerrilla war in the North that lasted until 1951. So the short answer is yes. Gotcha. Uh, and that looks like all the questions, guys. Once again, uh, you know, thanks, uh, Chris and Kevin, uh, for your just serious expertise, uh, historical knowledge, and just being able to, to take seriously complex issues and boil them down to the root causes and, and make them very palatable uh, in small pieces. It really helps deciphering history that way. Um, and I know that many of our audience members are thankful that, that, you, that you two are able to do that, along with a lot of our other guests as well. It really makes just looking at history uh, a very easy thing uh, to, to be able to, to, to digest. Uh, and Chris, if you see down there in the chat, has recommended a couple books uh, by Paul Preston, Anthony Beaver, and uh, Gilles Tremblay. Probably said that totally wrong, but uh, I still like the name Gilles. Um, anyway, we'll get off of how much I like that name and not mine. Um, but Kevin, Chris, <laughs> right? <laughs> Stop laughing at me, Kevin. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, so much uh, for uh, everything you do here at the museum and for putting on these presentations for us. And for everybody out there in our listening and watching audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions for us, you can always uh, uh, email us here at the museum. We'd be more than happy to answer any of them. Uh, and you can always find more of our events at our website, wispetsmuseum.com. Uh, go to the events section and you will find all of our upcoming programming there, uh, along with contact information for the different staff members for those email addresses. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Kevin, Chris, thanks again, guys. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, very soon. For all my movie buffs, I'll see you on Friday night for our uh, movie virtual discussion night. Thanks again, everyone.